It's not hard to father a child. It's a very different thing to be a daddy. I'm blessed many times to work with people who, who have been through broken relationships. And I've been in relationship recently with um, someone who had described to me that, that they, they, they married this woman. She had already been married. And uh, the, the, the marriage didn't work. There was a divorce. And now he, he loves this woman and he married her. And in his mind, he married the kids too. And he wants to adopt the kids. But then the kids come to a, a certain age and they have to decide, well, who am I going to call? Who's going to be my daddy? Who's going to be my father? Is it going to be my biological dad? Or is it going to be this person now who is with my mother? And that can be a very, very difficult thing for kids to go through. But the bottom line, it comes down to relationship. You may be a biological father, but not be a daddy, right? And you might be a stephusband to children, but you are their daddy. And so it's all about relationship. And in, in, in our world of brokenness, it gets more complicated. In the Word of God, it's not complicated at all. It's very, very simple. But our lives ha- unfortunately deviate from that. And, uh, but there's always a way back because... Our daddy is a redemptive father. He is a father that doesn't put all of these high conditions on being in relationship with him. There are some requirements, of course. There should be. In any relationship that has any value, there has to be some kind of requirements. But what he asks of us is not, it's not, it's simple, actually. It may not be easy um, because our life might not be where where he asks us to be in order to go in relationship with him. In uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14, and probably many of you have heard this passage before, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, what's amazing about that, it, it, this is a promise that God gave. And he gave it to Solomon when he was dedicating the temple. Now, Solomon's dad, David, many of you know King David, you know of King David. Well, King David, his whole life, he was a warrior. He was a very passionate warrior. He was a passionate musician. He taught all of the musicians in the choir and, and the orchestra He taught every one of them how to play their instrument. Stringed instrument, wind instrument. David was very, very talented. You might just know him as a warrior, but he was passionate in war, and he was passionate in music. He wrote many, many psalms, and the psalms that we read today, they were actually sung in the past, and they were sung by the people. And in those psalms are a lot of experiences in David's life that are very personal experiences, experiences in which he failed and, and, and he, he, he sinned greatly and, and he repented, and experiences where he called out to God and said, God, why are you letting the wicked prosper and, and, uh, and the good people are, are suffering? And there's a lot of personal self-disclosure of David in the Psalms. But every one of those Psalms was put to music and the people would sing those songs, knowing that this was the witness and testimony of their king. Isn't that, isn't that kind of cool? He was a very transparent person. And uh, his son Solomon was given one opportunity to ask God of anything at all in, in life and in the world. And Solomon asked God for what? Do you remember? What did he ask God for? Wisdom. Okay? And the word wisdom in the Hebrew language, underneath the word wisdom is a Hebrew word, and what it really means is the skill of living life. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is living life skillfully. Wisdom is living life by following principles that other people learn through their mistakes. Does that make sense? Living life by following principles that other people learn through their mistakes, and by listening to other people's testimony, (coughs) you're able to to make different choices, and then your life becomes a life of wisdom. And so wisdom is about living life. It's about choices. It's about walking out in the flesh those values and those principles. And so Solomon uh, had the opportunity uh, from God to do something that his father wanted to do his whole life. All of David's life, he had one desire in his heart, and God blessed him for it, 
because God said, David is a man after my own heart. The one desire David had his whole life was for God to no longer be living in a tent, but rather that God would live in a permanent dwelling. That was his desire his whole life. David longed for building a temple for God. Isn't that amazing? That's what he wanted his whole life. And, but God had a different idea. God appreciated the passion of David, and he respected it. I think he actually inspired it. If you have a dream that drives you, and you have a passion towards something in the future, and you know that it's not necessarily unbiblical, it's not a bad thing that you have the passion for, chances are that God has actually inspired that vision within you. And he will give you all that's needed in order to accomplish that. And David's vision was realized, but it wasn't realized by him personally. He got to prepare all the plans. He got to get all of the materials together, but it was his son, Solomon, that got to complete the project. And this is the day that Solomon was dedicating the temple that his father had envisioned that he had a chance to, uh, to realize. And so uh, it says in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 12, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. You know, we can say we do something for God, but God has to decide to actually come and, and, and receive that, okay? There's a lot of people that will say, well, I did this for God, you know? I'm buying a lottery ticket because I want to give, the, I want to give it to God, you know, once I win the lottery. Um, there's a lot of distorted views. By, I don't know if anyone's ever done that, but that's a distorted view. Because it runs against the law of sowing and reaping that is a spiritual law. And that spiritual law applies to you, applies to me. And that is that we reap as we, what? Sow. As we sow, so also we reap. And so you can't give two bucks and get two million dollars and, and, not, and, by, by, and viol- what it does is it violates the law of sowing and reaping. Okay. On average, the lottery winnings last 18 months, and it's gone. It doesn't matter how big the win, it's gone. You know why? Because it's a violation of the spiritual principle of sowing and reaping. What you work hard for, you, you will manage the best. You might still be a poor manager. <laughs> I don't know, but you'll manage best that which you work for. And so Solomon was plugged into uh, <clears throat> to all these spiritual principles And he called out to God, and he asked God to bless the place. And God responded, appeared to him, and said, I have made this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. And then he says, this is the context, if my people, so God says, here's what I'm doing. I'm coming and receiving this place as a place to dwell. Because you have built it and you have invited me to come, Solomon, I'm coming. It was actually a fulfillment of his promise to his father, David. And he says, but this is what I'm asking of my people. And here's the promise I'm making. And then this verse, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. So this morning, we're only going to do half of this message because I don't think you want to be here till 2 o'clock this afternoon. I'm known for being long-winded, so um, even half is going to fill the time, believe me. So what we need to look at this morning is, what does it mean? My people who are called by my name. Well, in the Word of God, the Apostle Paul says, you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having believed, you were marked in him with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. So in other words, if you heard the good news that Jesus died on the cross for you, and that he shed his blood for you, and that paid for for your sins, and if you accepted that and said, you know, Jesus, I received that gift of your life that was shed, your body that was broken for me. If you receive that, and you ask him to come into your life, at that moment, at that instantly at that moment, the Holy Spirit of God comes within your, 
your inner house. Let's picture the, the, your spirit, the life part of you, as an inner house. So the Holy Spirit comes in. Well, who is the Holy Spirit? Well, he's the Spirit of God, <clears throat> but he's also the Spirit of Jesus. I'll save you reading through books and books of theology about this thick, but he's also the Spirit of Jesus. In other words, he's the Spirit of the carpenter. What was Jesus in, in his lifetime? He, his heavenly daddy was Father God. His earthly dad was who? Joseph. And in those days, you didn't question about what your occupation was going to be. You were going to do what your father did. Sometimes even your name carried your occupation. If your name was blacksmith, guess what you did? <laughs> you were a blacksmith. And so Jesus was a carpenter. <clears throat> and he was a very good carpenter. And right up till 30 years old, from about maybe <coughs> 9 or 10 years old, that's what he was taught by his earthly father. And that's, and that's what he was. Can you imagine having a table or a chair made by Jesus? <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> Talk about an antique, eh? I love antiques, but that, that would be something awesome. And so Jesus was a carpenter. So the spirit of the carpenter comes to live in you. <clears throat> now, in your inner house, there's many rooms, like there is in, in, in anybody's house. Most of you have a house, or you live in an apartment, has more than one room in it, right? And you're probably not living in the closet. In fact, you might even be afraid to open the closet because you know what's in there and it might end up all over the floor. But for some people, they accept Jesus maybe at camp or they accept Jesus in Sunday school and that, but they restrict the spirit to a closet in their inner house. There are certain times and certain days that they will actually be aware that the spirit is within them. He's there all the time, but he's restricted and limited to a closet or maybe to certain rooms or spaces. But the bottom line is, he isn't released to inhabit and control the whole inner house. Now, we cannot have personal revival without the spirit being released to completely control our inner house. And when you get one, two, three, four, five people together who have released their life in such a way that they've allowed the Spirit to inhabit and fill their inner house, that's when you're now building up a storm that may lead to a major revival. But it may not turn out that way because revival starts where? With us, within our inner house. And so God says, if my people who are called by my name. In Isaiah 43, there is a, uh, an invitation. And, uh, and basically, the prophet Isaiah says this, But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. There's that word redeem. <clears throat> it means I, I have bought you back. It's like, you have pawned yourself off to the pawn shop, and Satan's the pawn shop keeper, but I've paid the price to buy you back. I've paid the price to redeem you. And I have called you by your name, and you are mine. And so in a very real, in a very real sense, when he says, those who are called by my name, there's an encounter that, each person is going to have where God initiates a relationship and calls you and names you. And that brings you into a relationship with him. So this passage is not, is not written specifically for people who don't know God. It's written for those who have had an encounter at one time in their life with the living God. And, but their life may not be wet so to speak, spiritually. It may be dry, and it may have dry places. And so this is an invitation by God that calls every one of his children who are called by, by his name out. And it says in Deuteronomy um, chapter 28, verse 10, it says this. Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. Isn't that interesting? That's back in Deuteronomy. Why would people be afraid 
of those who are called by the name of the Lord. You ever wonder about that? Why would people be afraid of them? I think one of the big reasons why people would be afraid is first and foremost, in a world where people are somewhat lost in terms of their identity, if you have anybody that stands up and says, I know who I am, I know why I'm here, I know what I'm called for, I have a reference point for my life that is unshakable. That's kind of scary for a lot of people. Because you know what? The majority of people don't really know who they are. They don't really know where they're going. And they don't have the confidence to even know, hey, here's a reference point for my identity. Some don't have a family that they can plug into and say, I've been born from this family. Benjamin, uh, this morning, is, is, is ministering at a church. And the beautiful thing about that is that my grandfather and my father and myself, we, we built that church, literally built that church. I mean, we constructed it. We were part of the making of that church. I served there as a, as a youth leader, as a Sunday school teacher, as a youth pastor. And uh, my mom and dad still go there today. My grandfather has passed. But, and, and so here he is, and it's, 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 it's a generational thing, right? It's, it's a purpose that's being fulfilled. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to fulfill purposes, not just in us. There comes a point when you get to be my age that... No, seriously, that it's, it's, it's really not about you, it's about your legacy. Does that make sense? There's a lot of times you may struggle about, well, how is my life going to be, and how am I going to survive, and me and my wife and the kids, how are we going to get through? But there comes a point where it changes. And what you're thinking about is, what am I going to leave behind? What am I going to pass on to the next generation? Who's going to carry that name? And who's going to carry the calling? Because you know what? The calling of the Lord is not just to one generation. It's to generation after generation after generation. And one of the beautiful things is, not only does he call you by name, but he calls your offspring by name. You might say, well, you don't know what my kids are doing today or what they're up to, or you wouldn't say that if you did. You know what? We have to look beyond where they're at today and say, how did we raise them? How did we train them up? And what are we speaking by way of intercession today? What are we declaring over them today about their future? Because their future is not obvious by the way they're living their life today. But they too will be brought to a place of encounter with God, and all that's been built into them will be brought back to this point. You see, this is a dedication of a temple. And there's a reason why God is making this statement, if my people... God does not control us like robots or he, say, he would say, I program my people and they will now do this, right? We have the freedom to decide. We're going to follow him, we're going to be in relationship with him, or we're not, or we're going to reject him. But, so he says, if my people will fulfill these four conditions, then I have promises on them. Number one, if they will humble themselves. Humble themselves. What does it mean to humble yourself? Well, If your life is like mine is, and it might not be, but usually it happens this way. Certain things go on in in life. I'm pressed. I'm brought to a, a point where my goals or my ideas are not working, and I'm running out of steam. Maybe I'm running out of hope. And then God uses that situation to humble me. I don't know if that happens to any of you. But, and then I realized, you know what? I should be crying out to God. <laughs> Duh. On me, not on you. Duh. You know, I should be calling out to God. And, but often I'm, I'm over the cliff, holding on to the root, and the root is ripping off from the cliff, and I'm about to fall a thousand feet, and I'm probably not going to survive that fall. This body will go really fast a thousand feet. I probably won't survive that fall. And then I'm crying with all my lungs out to God, right? Whereas what he's saying here is he's saying, let's be proactive about it. Let's get ahead of the crisis that's going to come, right? Why not bring yourself low before me now? Why wait until you're over the cliff and hanging by a thread, right? That's great for the movies, but it's not fun to live your life that way. 
And so he says, if my people will humble themselves, that's, that's the condition. Isn't that simple? I mean, doesn't it sound like a simple principle? But it's not simple. Because my pride and your pride gets in the way of humbling yourself. We all have a way that we think we should live our life. And that's the reference point we go to the quickest in our day-to-day life. And often that reference point is not necessarily the, the way God is calling us to live our life. And so to humble ourselves, we have to identify our pride and lay it down. And that even goes against the philosophy of our society. Our society today here in Quebec is postmodernism. What is postmodernism all about? It's all about experience. It's all about me having the best experience in life that I can possibly have. If you're not having a good experience, then change your life, change your partner, change your relationships, and have a better experience. There's no moral judgment on how you make your life better. Just do it, whatever you need to do to have a better experience, and then you will live out a fulfilled life, so says postmodernism. And you know what? A lot of people are living that way. That's the way they're living. It's all about experience and changing experience. That's not the way God calls us to live. God says, I have a higher purpose here for you. And no matter what your experience, the right thing is always the right thing, no matter how hard it is to do. I will meet you with my higher purpose for you to do the right thing. Some people in this world today are getting shot in the head for doing the right thing. And let's not think that it won't come here. (laughs) Not trying to scare you into heaven. I'm just saying that let's not think that those forces in the world of evil are not going to land here. In fact, they're already here. (laughs) Let's not think they won't rise up here because that would be thinking in in fairy tale. For anybody that's been watching the news lately, places that have been attacked by evil never thought it would happen there. When he says humble yourself, it's a personal invitation. In James 4.10, it says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Would you like to be lifted up by God? I can tell you that this last week wasn't the worst week of my life, but it's up within the top 10 of the worst weeks of my life. And constantly, I was faced with challenges that were dishonoring. Does Does that make sense to you? Have you ever been dishonored? But have you been dishonored over and over and over and over again? And after a while, you start to question your own honor. (laughs) You know, maybe there's nothing that I should be honored for, right? Which is completely and totally ridiculous. But when there's an onslaught of those kinds of things in my life, then I can look at that situation and say, boy, (laughs) this is very humbling. This is very humiliating. On Monday alone, I moved my office three times. At one point, I was expected to be in the same place in the community, moving my office, when I was actually intervening in a crisis situation. And there was a whole bunch of new crisis situations that came this week, but I was told two weeks ago that this would be my last week. And I've been going there for the last 15 years. Now, how do you help people that you're just hearing their story for the first time? And they say, oh, well, can I see you next time you come? And you're not booked to come next time because of money, because of budget. Now, I believe God's going to overcome that, but that was just some of the challenges in my week. But you know what? We're not called to fulfill our calling on our own. We live in relationship with other believers too, you know? I had a few texts with Tony, and uh, without giving anything away in his life, my life was a piece of cake this week compared to his. Just saying. Okay, And that encourages us because we're not in the trenches alone. We're in the trenches with others too who are fighting the same battle, but maybe they're being fired on even more than us. But we don't know unless we connect, right? And God used his struggles, just whatever I knew of that, to encourage me and to say, you know what? 
I need to receive this. Is maybe God is trying to humble me in some ways. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know why he's doing it, but I'm still going to serve him in this situation. He says, humble your, humble, humbling yourself is a choice. Here's an interesting thing in Isaiah 66. If you have your Bible, that's fine. If not, you can get these references later. In Isaiah 66, what is God looking for? Who does God recognize? When he looks from heaven, the Bible tells us. Do you want to know if God is looking at you? I mean, he's, he's all present. But what catches his attention? What can I do for God that catches his attention? In Isaiah 66, it says this. God is speaking. It says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. That's a pretty big throne, isn't it? <laughs> where is the house you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? Those are rhetorical questions. There is no place you can build for me. There is no place for me to rest. I'm God. But he asks those questions anyhow to get us thinking. For all those things my hand has made. And all those things exist, says the Lord, but on this one will I look. So what's going to get God's attention? He's got the whole universe to look at. What gets his attention? On this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. What is God looking at? What's he looking for? Do you know that word contrite in spirit means as if you are smitten by a sword, not killed, smitten by a sword. So a sword smites you and you have a gash and, and you're bleeding, but you're still alive. You're probably not on your feet. You're probably down on your knees, just absorbing the blow of that sword. That is who God is looking at spiritually. As if we've been smitten by a sword and we're down on our knees and we're wounded, but in our woundedness, we're looking up and we're acknowledging him to be the glorious father, our Abba, Daddy, who is in control of all things, and we're brought low before him. That's what it means to humble yourself. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 5. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that in due time he will lift you up, casting all your cares and anxieties on me. So that invitation... The first if is if we will humble ourselves. But he doesn't stop there. It sounds like enough there, doesn't it? But he doesn't stop there. Because in due time, he will lift you up. When is due time? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know when due time is? When is due time? Well, you know what? It's not about our clock. It's not about our watch. It's about the watch, the clock, that measures the unfolding of the kingdom of God. God has a due time for you. And if you are following these things this morning, and you decide this morning that, you know what, my heart needs to be renewed. I want to have that personal revival in my life. Then in due time, God will not only lift you up from the ground where you may have been smitten by a sword, but he will promote you in the fulfilling of his kingdom promises. We don't want man's promotion. We want God's promotion. <laughs> right? Because man often doesn't recognize what God promotes. Man will often scoff at what God has anointed, just like they scoffed at Noah when he was building an ark and there hadn't been any rain and there was no sea around or nothing. But no, when the waters were rising and everyone was knocking on the side of that sealed vessel, there was no more scoffing. Because God had promoted him and his family and those that believed and, and they were able to survive the floods. If the first thing is that we're to humble ourselves, the second thing is we're to pray. Now, how do we pray? Well, the Bible's not complicated about that. Jesus taught us how to pray. He taught his disciples how to pray, and it's the same prayer for us. Our Father, right, who art in heaven, acknowledging God, because he's always first. 
Hallowed be thy name, reverencing the name of God. Thy kingdom come, not my kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's already fulfilled in heaven. Question is, are we going to be the ones that fulfill it on earth? And he says, give us this day our daily bread. You know, sometimes I'm praying, like, give me this year our daily bread. (laughs) How are we going to make it through this year? It's the wrong way to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. Why do we have to live day by day just to eat? I think one of the reasons what God has shown me is it keeps me dependent on him. Does that make sense? It keeps me calling out to him. Because no matter what job you have to do, I don't know what your occupation is. I don't know what your job is. I don't have to. Because none of them are secure. We do not live in that kind of world anymore where I work for 30 years for CN and and I'm going to retire and get their pension. (laughs) Good luck with that one. Right? Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For whose is the kingdom? Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for how long? Forever and ever. When you see see forever and ever, we're talking about eternity. We're not talking about time on earth. And then it finishes up with an amen, which means what? So be it. That's what it means. When we're called to pray, we've been given the prayers to pray. But you know what? When it comes to a renewal in our life, it means that there's something that's been lacking. There's something that I've been depending on other than God, whether it's myself, or maybe there's idolatry in my life. Maybe I've been worshiping other people and things rather than the Creator who's forever praised. It doesn't matter what it is in that moment. The prayer that I'm called to is a prayer of confession. Confession is coming before our daddy, who is also our judge, and saying, I'm guilty of whatever you have recorded that I've done against you. (laughs) I'm guilty. There's no need for a trial. (laughs) I'm guilty. I confess. You're right to have those charges against me. Thanks be for Jesus, who is my sacrificial lamb, who is my defense attorney, that when God looks down on us, he sees Jesus and he declares us righteous. I'll never understand that. I can teach it theologically, but I'll never, ever, ever get that or understand that, how God sees me as righteous (laughs) and blameless. It's because he sees the life of his son. So we're told in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess to him, he is what? He's faithful and just, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All means all. So not only does God want to forgive us, he wants to cleanse us. And I don't know, if, if maybe, do you remember the first time some of you in here have received Jesus into your life? Do you remember it clearly, those that have? Yeah, I see some heads nodding, okay. You'll never forget that. That will always be In your memory, there are certain events that are called, in psychology, they're called salient. It means that they're very close to the surface in our thinking. And events like that are very close to the surface in our thinking. And when we remember back to what changed in that moment, how miraculous it was, I remember that I had at least, there was a renewal around age 16. We were in Colorado. I had a gospel band called Reborn. We drove to Colorado to do some competitions with other gospel bands. So my whole band was there, all five of us. We were in Colorado, and Bill Bright, did anyone, any of you ever hear of Bill Bright? Um, Campus Crusade, he, he was just a, a, a giant in, in evangelism. He gave the message that morning, and a very clear, simple gospel message, and I rededicated my life to the Lord. Even though we were on the road as a gospel band, evangelizing as we went, I needed to recommit my heart to the Lord. And I remember coming out and looking in those hills in, in, uh, in Estes Park, Colorado. And uh, everything just came alive. The colors were so bright. The sounds were so crisp. It was snowing and even the snowflakes made a sound. Do you know that? Even the snowflakes made a sound. And, and it was just one of those things I'll never, ever forget. I can, if I close my eyes, I can see myself there. 
in that situation. And that was one of those times where I said, Lord, I confess every known sin that at that time that, that I had been hiding, that I'd been keeping away from him, I just poured it all out. I didn't care who was looking. I didn't care if my band was up with me or not. And, uh, and I had that experience. And I knew that God had done something very, very deep in my heart. Isaiah, when he was called as a prophet, had a, had a very powerful experience. He, whether it was a dream that he was in, but he basically came into the temple and he stood at the threshold of the temple. That's where you're, you're walking in the doorway of the temple. And he looked and he saw the back of the robe of the living God. And he said this, woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And he fell on his face. That was, that was his calling. That was when he was called. He was just about to be called. And you know what God did? Think of the conditions. If my people who are called by my name, this hasn't changed for thousands of years. These conditions have not changed. Will humble themselves. Was Isaiah humbling himself? He was on his face. Have you ever eaten dust? Have you ever been asking for forgiveness from somebody and you're crawling on your belly and, you, and your lip is, is crawling through the dust? That's how they did it. The prodigal son, when he came back to the father after spending his inheritance amongst the Gentiles, he was supposed to fall on his face and eat dust till he was in 10 feet of the father and then his father would decide whether he would speak to him or not. That was the Jewish way at the time. Can you imagine? My dad never made me do that when I was disobedient, right? So Isaiah, he's humbled. Did he speak? Did he pray? Yeah, he confessed. I'm a man of unclean lips. If my people who will what? Humble themselves and pray. And what happened? God sent angels flying over to an altar where there were coals burning. The angels picked up coals the angels flew over to Isaiah and touched his lips. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. What did God do? God touched his lips with fire. Fire represents the Holy Spirit. Fire represents cleansing. God, at that point, burnt out all of the sin within Isaiah. And he was cleansed. And then he was shortly after that commissioned. If we humble ourselves, if we pray, and then he says, if you seek my face. Isaiah said later in Isaiah 56, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him. And we're told in the New Testament, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. Humble yourself, pray, seek his face. What does it mean to seek his face? It means this. That the depth of your deepest emotions, your greatest affection, is set first on the Lord. Okay? My wife is rocking our grandson at the back. I have very deep affection for my wife. <laughs> I have deep affection for my grandson. Do you know that if I put them first in my affections, that I'm an idolater? That's what the Word of God says. That first and foremost, our deepest affections are to be placed on who? On the Lord. Is that an easy thing? Not when you have your affections placed on precious people in your life. That's not an easy thing. We're talking about radical shift in terms of affection. Right? Radical shift. But you know what? Nothing good happens in our life without radical shifts. <laughs> and if we don't make that shift, God will make it for us. Why? Because we are his people called by his name. If you don't make that shift this morning, that's not a negative vote on, on me or, or, or any message I bring. All it means is God's going to find another point in the future to call you to that radical shift. <laughs> that's what it means. God reminds us as preachers, don't take the response personally. Don't take the numbers personally because 
It's about their relationship with me. God said to Samuel, Samuel, stop mourning for Saul. I've taken the kingdom away from him. I've given it to David. So rise up, wake up, get over it. Saul is not my guy. Get your horn, fill it with oil, and go find the son of Jesse because you have to anoint the next king. And Samuel was still grieving over Saul because he thought this was his project. It was the Samuel project to make Saul this great king and that the line would be carried down all the way to the Messiah. Ah, wrong. We don't have the foresight. God's always ahead of us. He had chosen David. And so Saul had to get up. He had to pack his horn and his oil, and he had to go out and find the son of Jesse. Not even David's father Jesse recognized that he could be king. He left him out on the fields looking after sheep. Samuel went through all of the brothers of David, and he said to Jesse, these are all your sons? No, well, there's this little runt out on the hill <laughs> looking after the sheep. I mean, <laughs> bring him in. Because that little runt was going to grow up to slay giants. <laughs> that little runt was going to be one of the greatest kings that ever lived. You know. Because God knew how he was going to carry out his plan, and he looks for people who would seek his face. Jesse didn't know that his son David called out to God every night because David was just a kid. He was nine, ten years old, out all night long with lions and bears and everything, and he learned to call upon God. He learned how to, how to work a slingshot, and God anointed him, and he defeated every animal that tried to come and take the sheep. God was training him to shepherd a nation, at nine years old, by starting with shepherding sheep, which was one of the lowest jobs you could have in those times. But God was training him as a nine-year-old to shepherd a nation. You see, God has you in a tough place, and you can't figure out, why would I be doing this kind of work? Why would I have to go through this kind of things? Why do I have to clean outhouses by jumping down inside and taking all the... I'm telling you, God has a purpose that he's preparing you to fulfill that requires that you go through a lot of outhouses. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not a glorious present. But in the future, you'll look back, and one day you'll say, I'm glad that God brought me through all those difficult times. Because it taught me to what? It taught me to humble myself. It taught me to pray. It taught me to seek his face. When there was no other face to look at that would bring any hope or life, we seek the face of God. And then finally, there's a fourth condition here. And like, this is just half the message. You know why I'm doing just the first half today now, right? <laughs> if we humble ourselves, if we pray, if we seek his face, and then it says, repent and turn from your wicked ways. Listen. I work with a lot of broken people, a lot of broken relationships. And they'll be in front of me. I'll have a couple in front of me, a family in front of me. I'll have a person in front of me. And, and they'll say, you know, I know I blew it, but I said I was sorry. Does it, does it say here to say that we're sorry? No. Because saying you're sorry doesn't mean you're repentant. That might be the start of a journey of repentance. But I'm giving it away to you. Repentance is a journey. Repentance is turning away from that which I'm depending on, which is usually not God. Does that make sense? Recognizing that I'm depending on that, like that, that little uh, uh, computer up there that has the nice little P on it. I've been depending upon that thing. I've been moving towards that thing. I know that thing's going to save me. I know that that's going to give me the life that I need. And I've been pursuing that thing. And now somebody told me I'm probably not going to get it from that little machine. Oh. God says, why have you been trying to get it from that machine? Why haven't you been coming to me? And I go, God, I'm sorry, but where am I still facing? Because it's been giving me something, a false hope. It's been giving me maybe spiritual fast food, right? Isn't it quicker today to go through McDonald's drive-thru than it is to go home and make a meal from good ingredients? 
Good ingredients, right? Are you going to get any nutrition from McDonald's at all? No. But you, like me, will probably go through there because it's fast and it's quick and it's physical fast food. So also, we are addicted to spiritual fast food. We try to get our hope. We try to get our confidence. We try to get encouragement. We try to feel better inside from that which cannot give us the nurturance that we need. So saying, okay, God, I'm sorry. I, I know it's silly. I shouldn't have been depending on that silly pee on the machine there. But I'm still facing it. Remember the prodigal son? He was feeding pigs. And then he was chasing after the food he just gave to the pigs because he was so hungry. But he was eating. He, he came to his senses, it said. And he thought in his head, my dad's servants back home on the farm get better food than this. And they have shelter. I think I should go home. But you know what he had to do? He had to leave the pig food and move towards the Father. That's what repentance is. Repentance is turning our back on the fast food we've been depending upon and pursuing the father. How many days journey did the prodigal have to go before he got home? We're not told that in the scriptures, but we know it was several days. In other words, am I prepared to go hungry from that which I've been feeding my soul from and take a journey hungry, but I'm not going to eat again until I receive it from the Lord? That's what repentance means. Does that make sense? It's a lot more than saying I'm sorry, right? Justin Bieber has a new song out, Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, listen to it. You'll find about just how shallow it is. <laughs> and he's from a believing upbringing. But the song is sorry. And you know what? The song, there's no repentance in the song at all. Because halfway through the song, it's kind of like, well, you hurt me and I hurt you. And, you know, and all of what we hear from postmodernism, you know, guess what? Tony hurt me, I hurt him, so can we just cancel it out and just go on in life and we can sing along with Bieber, right? <laughs> well, you can't claim to have a transformed life and put out a song that says sorry and think that everybody's stupid enough to believe it except some of the star crazed fans who will worship anything that he says because they're worshiping him and that's called idolatry. Does that make sense? We're not called to be idolaters. I'm not nothing against Justin. I even prayed for the guy, especially after I heard the song. <laughs> I paid for the download because I want to be in touch with the way young people are thinking today because when I get up north, I'm working with teenage girls, teenage boys who are listening to all kinds of stuff and I say to them, what's your favorite song? I better not be stupid about it. I know what their favorite songs are, so I listen to them so that I can relate, because music is a way I can connect with them. Then we talk about the words. <laughs> what are we saying this morning? Let's just stand. God wants us to turn away from our wicked ways. And we have rationalized in our hearts that our ways aren't that wicked, maybe a little bit misguided, maybe not exactly what I should be doing. But I want you to think this morning, this is between you and God. This is not about me, not about, I mean, these are, these are not my words. These are God's words. God is saying, if you, he's calling you by name. He's saying, if you, Gordon, will humble yourself before me. If you, Gordon, will confess your sinfulness to me. If you, Gordon, will seek my face and if you will turn from those things that you feed on every day, the time and the energy and the affection you put on those other things, if you would put that time and affection on me first, I'll bless you with those other things. But there's more that I'm going to do for you. This message is if, but the next message, whenever Tony has me back again, is going to be then. Because there's a promise that comes with this. But you can read ahead on that in Second Chronicles 7. What's important this morning is not that you have the rest of the message. What is important this morning is that you respond to what you know already. Does that make sense? 
that's not important to have the whole thing if we're not digesting the beginning. And so just close your eyes where you are. And in your heart of hearts this morning, ask this question. Do I really want to have personal revival? Do I really know what that looks like? Maybe, maybe you tasted it when you were converted. Maybe you've committed your life to him before, but do I really want to have personal revival? And if the answer to that is no, then, then God bless you. That's fine. He's going to call you at another time. But if the answer is yes, am I really willing right now to confess to him my sinfulness of heart? God, you know that I have a bent towards depending upon things that and making them more important than you. Then pray from your heart of hearts this morning. Lord, I confess to you my sinfulness. And I've known you to be my Savior and my friend. There's been times in my life that I've been so close to you. But I've wandered away, and I, I confess that is sin right now. And Father, I seek your face this morning. I want to reinvest my affections in you, Lord. I want my first thought in the morning as I wake up to be of you. I want to wake up in the night at times and think of you.